Hey everybody, it's Chugga Conroy. Welcome back to more Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. Last time, we slayed Bellum and returned peace to the finally name dropped World of the Ocean King. After Ciela, Oceus, and the other spirits went back to live in their domain, they returned us back to our pirate ship so that we may continue on our quest to find new lands. This time, well, this is the addendum that's gonna be containing all the little bonus trinkets that we didn't get a chance to see. So how about we start out with the thing that you guys care about the most when you tune into these, so that you can get on with your day and not with giving the audience retention time. The beta stuff. We've discussed most of what's already out there about this game's development, and there isn't a whole lot that exists that's out in the public just because this is one of the less discussed sagas in the Zelda canon, but here's what we got. This is the final icon used on the DS menu, but here is the original that was used earlier in development. I swear this video gets more exciting. In the game's sound files is this. That's the lock-on sound effect from Ocarina of Time, which could mean that this was originally going to be an outright 3D game instead of top-down with 3D elements, especially since there's a lot of bosses and minigames that are proper 3D in the finished game. But this also could mean that it was just put in the game as a sound test. Sound designers and programmers often start development by porting in pre-existing sounds and music, then listening back to how the game renders the audio, just to make sure that it's working correctly before they start designing how the game is going to sound. My favorite piece of beta content that I just never got around to because there were so many important points I had to hit every time we had to go back to the Temple of the Ocean King, is how Murkay Island was originally planned to be. In the final game, it changes a little on repeat visits, like the bridge getting repaired or the treasure teller opening for business. The plan was for it to start out as a small village and eventually develop into a big city as the game progressed. And these Howl's Moving Castle-esque designs that they made for that concept are beautiful and well beyond the scope of anything in the game. I wish they would do this, because seriously, what a waste of good imagination. I got a tweet from Twitter user Nutty Inc who told me that Nintendo Power Issue 205 shows the beta of Phantom Hourglass, which I've seen this documented nowhere on the internet, so I thank you greatly for this. You can see some differences, such as much simpler maps, a very boring looking quadrant of the sea that had almost nothing in it. It looks as though that puzzle to open the Tower of the Gods from Wind Waker was going to make a return in this game, which I have to say, probably would have been a lot more effective with being able to draw your own maps and come to that conclusion yourself. Besides that, it's just layout differences, differently shaped islands, differently shaped dungeon layouts. What I found kind of intriguing is that one of my complaints was that the visual style occasionally looked boring and repetitive, and yet this screenshot shows early grass and tree textures that I think look far superior to what we ended up getting. There are some other unused locations that have been dug up by hackers, but they're pretty much all test rooms or just earlier versions of the same areas. All of the intriguing points have already been hit. That's all for now, so into the world of the Ocean King, which is only ever officially name dropped by Leaf in that cutscene. Gonna be cleaning up that adventure mode. The Stormy Seas are where you respawn after saving just before taking on Bella. That's an awkward way of wording that, but you know what I mean. The ghost ship can be selected on the map to go to the final boss fight anytime, but you are actually free to explore all you want. You can shop at Beatles, you can go to any island, you can teleport anywhere. If there's any last second preparations to be done before the final battle, not to worry. You are not locked in beyond a point of no return if you die or if you reload. And in fact, the seas are only actually stormy for about 100 square feet around the ship, so, uh... Yeah, real effective world-ending powers you have there, Bellum. Our point. Oh, today is point day. You'll earn five times the points for each purchase. Wow, these savings are so crazy. I'm turning into Beetle myself. What do you got? A battle wheel. <laughs> Already got me one of those. What about this one? Uh, an arch handrail. I'll take that to start out. That's probably not going to be worth any points because it's not even a hundred rupees. I have every handrail, and I don't need the battle wheel, but I do need the points, and if I get five times points, that's 20 right there, and that's roughly what I need anyway. Thank you. Bye. Oh, you now have 200 points. 
You're now an official Beetle VIP! Beetle VIPs get 40% off all merchandise and a very nice letter. I bet you can't wait to receive it. You can't earn any more points, but keep shopping at Beetle Shop Ship. TM. We gotta go to an aisle to claim that letter, and what closer one than Merke Isle? Special delivery! Watch out, incoming! I hope you bump your shit on that one of these days because you were because I wasn't watching out. This is a letter from Beetle. Ahem. Here goes. VIP membership notice. Thank you for continuing to support my stores. Always me, Beetle. Your recent purchase now puts your points at 200. Wee Dealy! Thus, your membership has been upgraded to VIP. Wee Dealy VIP! As a thank you, I'm going to put my true feelings to the page. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much! Thanks, thanks, thanks so much! Looking forward to seeing you again, Beetle. Bye bye! And that's the end of it. Oh, my valued VIP customer! Thank you for maxing out your points! I normally pad my prices, but for you, dear VIP, I will resist the urge. That's all he has to say now. <laughs> you get a very nice discount. <laughs> 360 rupees, one for every degree it rotates. I see how you go about pricing your stuff. That's all the text that Beetle has for you. So for those of you that were kind of worried that it wasn't going to show up as VIP program, you are both satiated and now you understand why I didn't think it was such a big deal. I've seen this VIP program reward not documented well on the internet and a lot of places saying that it maxes out at 200 points, but it's not known or citation needed on what it actually gives you. Well, now you have a citation for proof. I'm counting on you to edit those wikis for me. When going out to sea, Linebeck will say that we must sail to where the ghost ship sank for Tetra. I don't know if that's a way of saying that I have no chances with her anymore in some backhanded way, but um, pretending it's not an insult from the Leinster himself, the ghost ship is not actually sunk. You can see it floating clear as day on the map screen and also when we were over there. Yet, when you approach it, it picks up after the ship sank where the boss fight begins. It was probably just so you wouldn't have to replay the boat shooting part of it again because it does go on for kind of a long time and it'd be kind of annoying to have to replay that every time you'd want to actually do the sword duel again because that's clearly the better of the phases. Um, just thought I'd point it out. Next, we are answering the question of what treasures were hidden at the bottom of the Temple of the Ocean King that could only be accessed with a hammer. The first of them is right here. Well, if there's one thing we know, it doesn't contain a power gem, wisdom gem, courage gem, any time in the Phantom Hourglass, or another treasure map, so what could it possibly have that would be important? A big gold rupee. Number two, and I ain't talking about the poop in these pirate terms. Hello, probably inconsequential chest. How do you do today? Inconsequential? Well, that's okay. I think you're pretty consequential with a shell anchor. Do I have that? I just realized that might be the last time that I asked that question out loud, and that makes me a little sad to know. No, I didn't! That was a new ship part after all this time! And also, just to be clear, there are 31 treasure charts in the world of the Ocean King, not 30. We've gotten them all and redeemed all the treasures. Many of them are randomly generated, so your results will vary from mine, but I've at least shown you where all the X's are and where all the charts are. On the note of ship parts, we need to talk about those. Here is what all the non-golden ship part series look like when they're complete. I'm not interested in going out for all of them myself just because it's random chance and I've already completed one of the ship part sets. If you've completed any non-golden set, you've completed them all because they all give the bonus of seven heart containers. Save for last, of course, is the gold series. What makes this so special? I've said that the stats are better. Well, it is easier to reach these heart container bonuses with the gold series, able to get these seven heart containers with only five of the pieces. The complete set rewards eight heart containers, the most that it is possible to have on any ship. How do you get a golden ship part complete set? We've seen that Beetle carries them for astronomical amounts of money, and that it's possible to get them from the big plays in battle mode. Anything else? I can't believe I am saying this. Back on Merkay for the third time today, we're going north. Not that, oh yes that. Yes that indeed. I hear you saying no, no anything but that, but no, we're doing it, we're doing it. On the collection screen, 
which you can open by pressing select. I never knew that. Thank you for teaching me that. I had a few comments pointed out. Really helpful for changing the spirits on a dime. My clear time in the Temple of the Ocean King is 18 minutes and 46 seconds remaining in the Phantom Hourglass out of a possible 25 minutes. I'd like to improve on that score a little, even if I can't get it perfect. There are guides dedicated solely to getting your time down to zero seconds, but I'm just gonna open up and say I'm not that good, and I'm also not that dedicated to getting a perfect time in the Temple of the Ocean King. Maybe you really love the Temple of the Ocean King and you run it every day just to prove to yourself that you can keep getting zero seconds over and over again, and if you are that guy, I salute you. It's great that you have a favorite dungeon and that it's one that a lot of other people get misery out of, but you've managed to enjoy it in spite of what other people think. That is fantastic. I'm just not that guy. I'm sorry. In case you're wondering, killing all the phantoms again does actually respawn the chests. This is a way to endlessly get random ship parts and random treasures if you so desire. I've done it on this first basement floor just to demonstrate this fact, but I won't be going after them all again because I want to get a good time. On the way down as I speed through this, I'd like to discuss something that I've hinted at a little bit. What is the world of the Ocean King? This is the only Zelda that it makes any appearance in, and there's not a whole lot of lore about it. All we know is that it's a world other than the one that Link and Zelda are from, which is a flooded Hyrule that turned into a great ocean. My personal theory, I thought of this on my own, looked it up, and I found a few people on message boards saying the exact same thing, is that this game takes place in a ruined Termina, in the timeline opposite to Majora's Mask where those events never took place. The reason why I think this is the case is that not only is it a world opposite to Hyrule, but Termina was destined to be destroyed. There are many characters who appear in Wind Waker, but have new names and don't recognize Link in this game. There's Old Man Ho-Ho in Wind Waker versus the Ho-Ho tribe in Phantom Hourglass. Salvatore looks the same and has the same name, but does not recognize Link. Two wind gods who are very similar, Silos in Phantom Hourglass and Cyclos in Wind Waker. And probably the biggest one, this is where I hinted at this earlier, we know in the events of Majora's Mask that the Happy Mask Salesman is the same one from Hyrule who merely stumbled his way into Termina just like Link did. We've never seen the Terminian counterpart of the Happy Mask Salesman, and I think it's the Man of Smiles, because he is the only other character that bears any kind of striking resemblance that we have ever seen. The Happy Mask Salesman is shrouded in a lot of mystery, and I think that this guy's weird mannerisms as well as his face are very uncanny. We also know that Bellum lures people in from Link and Zelda's world into this world, and it's possible that maybe that happened to Beetle as well. And perhaps Friedel is his Terminian counterpart. The Link in Majora's Mask is not the same Link as this Link. Majora's Mask Link debatably could have had a counterpart in Link the Goron or Tingle. This Link also has a Terminian counterpart in the form of Nyave, which is about as Terminian as it gets in terms of uncanny resemblance. There's also some geographical things, like the Isle of Frost having Gorons that live near it, implying that it might be the mountaintop of Snowhead. Some of this were things that I thought of on my own, but a lot of it was not, and I'd like to thank a user on Zelda Universe known as Boido for compiling a lot of this information, because this is seriously some good stuff, and it was awesome to find that somebody had thought this deeply into something that I just thought, hey, wait a minute about one day. <laughs> Another theory that I'd like to present is that Oceus is some sort of god. You have Cyclos being a friend of Oceus, who is also some sort of god, and then you have Bellum. Based on their color scheme and abilities, I think it's fair to say that these might be the counterparts for wisdom, courage, and power, respectively. The fact that wind is closely associated with courage, as well as the color green, you have Oceus being very associated with wisdom, and then Bellum is an outsider who is just trying to conquer everything. The only piece of information that really conflicts with this theory is that in a book released a couple years ago, they altered the official Zelda timeline to say that Termina never existed and was a world that Majora created itself just to mess with Link and that it stopped existing once Link was no longer there. I have never liked this piece of information. They wrote this 20 years after the game's release, 10 years after the release of this one, and there's no evidence to support this being the case in the game at all. 
In fact, the game outright contradicts this because you see things happening in Termina after Link has left it during the credits. In this case, I'm going to say the book is wrong. I'm sorry, this just really bothers me because I love Majora's Mask so much and I feel like this just cheapens the game so much for no reason. Because they didn't have to alter it to do this at all, the timeline worked fine before. But yes, that is my theory. I look so cool standing in front of that door! That's 22 minutes, 55 seconds. Upon reaching the end of the dungeon, each time, there are two treasure chests that spawn in. Number one, Golden Chimney! Well, you know where this was going. I was going to say that these chests are not guaranteed golden ship parts, but they have heightened chances of having golden ship parts inside. It doesn't seem that better times translate into better rewards. I could believe that being the case. There's not a lot of information out there about it. Dignified ship. It can be garbage, but it can also be good. I had both happen to me. And remember how the ceiling was caving in during the first fight with Bellum? We can't go back into that room. It is one time only, one way deal. There were 45, or uh, roughly a minute or so that I could have saved that I saw, so it's not impossible to do. I think if I kept at it and maybe did like one or two more attempts, I could have it. I had a Poe that I killed get stuck in a wall so I didn't get the 30 seconds off of it um, out of its uh, drop sand. And then there were two times that a Poe hit me, making me lose 15 seconds each. Um, unfortunately, the Spirit of Wisdom does not protect you from Poe's, only from Phantoms. Twitter user Mr. Toad the Gamer informed me that the Wii U version of Phantom Hourglass is very exploitable because random ship parts and treasures are rolled when you open the chest. So, for instance, when running the Temple of the Ocean King, you could metagame this and get gold ship parts every time. You can get revenge on them for making you run this dungeon again and again after finishing the game. There's unfortunately not a whole lot of other th points that I wanted to hit, so let's get to some small miscellaneous features before we move on to the final stuff. Shoot seagulls while sailing, shoot seagulls while sailing, shoot seagulls while sailing, shoot seagulls while sailing, shoot seagulls while sailing. That's actually kind of hard to say. Skylar Neville on Twitter informed me of a very fascinating piece of canon that I've not seen mentioned anywhere else. If you go see Astrid and get your fortune told after you get the regal necklace, but before going to the Cobble Kingdom, she will say, I see that you have the regal necklace, Link. You know, Kayo and I hail from the Cobble Kingdom. Some people see far with powers that grow when we pass from life. Seeing that necklace, I know you are destined to walk the Isle of Ruins. This explains why the Isle of Ember seems like it was well settled, yet there's only one person living there, and it's because they were here too long and wiped out by Bellum. Astrid's one of my favorite minor characters, and I have to thank you a lot for pointing this one out to me, because I was unaware completely. This is a speedrunning tactic! This is a speedrunning tactic! This is a speedrunning tactic! A common request that I got is that if a hammer kills pretty much anything in one hit, if it hits grass so hard that it slashes it, what happens if you hit a cuckoo in it? It does actually take damage, and that's what happens when you royally piss off cuckoos in this game! Oh god, 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 they're invincible! Wow, what is actually happening right now? Oh. Maybe I won't actually take damage from that if I uh, had the uh, Spirit of Wisdom on. Uh, yeah, that's right, you better run. You better run. If I come at you with my sword, you're gonna instantly turn into fried chicken, I swear. And then the other request I had is, what happens if you grapple hook two Kukos together? <laughs> you make them mates! <laughs> their, their synchronized pecawing is really cute. It's funny that it even lets you do that. I was wondering if they were gonna run around with ropes. I was wondering if they were gonna run around with their butts tied together by a rope. There is a skeleton somewhere in this game that says that the only reason he died is because they wouldn't let him use the D-pad. And all I have to say is to all the people that complained about the controls, Burr! With all the wacky ideas present in this game, a joke like that is so at home. 
I don't blame you for not liking the controls, but to all the people who said the controls were impossible to master and, wow, it's the only reason I ever died, the enemies in this game don't even hit that hard. And besides, my seven and nine-year-old cousins were able to beat this game without use of a guide. I am sure that the controls are fine enough, even if they do malfunction from time to time. I'll admit, they don't always work perfectly. I even noted it a few times that it happens to the best of us, that sometimes it just doesn't do quite what you wanted. But you can master them. And I love that jab at all those internet comments that the developers knew they were going to get eventually. <laughs> An extremely thoughtful feature in the Japanese version is that whenever there's kanji on the screen, you can tap it to see it written out. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to English, but would be a helpful tool to somebody who is learning Japanese, or perhaps children who are not familiar with all forms of kanji yet. This is a wonderful example of how video games can be used to make people want to learn things, and this would be a great game to try to learn Japanese with. Probably the only tip about the Temple of the Ocean King I never told you is that the Great Spin Attack does not make noise on noisy floors. Because I had a surprising number of people who are just like me wanting to know this, here's what it looks like when you actually give the Gossip Stone the 20 rupees to reveal the locations of treasure chests. Has a unique graphic, and he also tells you to mark it. How nice of him. It's a good service, another good use of the map, all right, yeah, you can erase it. I kept meaning to do this, but I kept telling myself next time, next time, next time, and by the time I was really gonna do it, there weren't any gossip stones left. You can also talk to him again, or uh, poke him in the face again to tell you all over again. Apparently, Friedel is a man. Has masculine names in other languages, such as Barry. Friedel itself is gender neutral, and the female gender seems to come from the Prima Strategy Guide, which again, I don't exactly trust. It's basically a requirement that any hot AAA title has to have pre-order bonuses and special edition consoles to go along with it, and Phantom Hourglass was no exception. There was a gold Triforce DS Lite that's pretty nice looking, but the real gold is this quill pen stylus. I like my DSi XL stylus very, very much, but this one is just stylish. Huh? Uh, okay, whatever. I just thought I'd show it to you because it's one of my favorite Zelda-related items. Great attention to detail in the last phase of the final boss fight. Because Ciel has been captured, you can't use the Spirit of Courage sword beams or the hammer. For our last point today, let's talk about Bellum himself, because we don't get to know a whole lot about him. For any sort of details that we do get to know about Bellum, originally in development, his name was Grand Octo. He was intended to be a leader of the Octoroks, and it seems as though the Octo Mines and various other types of Octoroks were designed to be Bellum's minions, but were reduced in role. Now wait, I hear you say, Bellum might have some traits of an octopus, but he's clearly much more designed to look like a squid. Well, Hyrule Historia states that Bellum is the ultimate Octorok, and that the Octoroks are its minions and offspring. It seems as though Octo Mines were designed specifically to be Bellum's henchmen, but were perhaps reduced in role. I think they look a lot more like larval forms of Bellum. But for those of you that are saying that he looks more like a squid, I agree with you, and I will point out that squids are a natural enemy of sperm whales, which is what Oceus is, so it makes a lot of sense from that perspective as well. As for Bellum's character, it's unclear if Bellum is a primal animal acting on instinct, or if he's a malicious sentient being since he never says anything else other than Link. The manga is not gospel and should not be taken as such, but it goes with the sentient approach, and personally, I like it better that way. That's all the information I've been able to dig up. Good boss fights, disappointing bad guy. And for all the ranting and raving and so many other things that I have done saying praise about the boss fights, I think I need to settle this once and for all and look up who made them. There's nobody credited specifically with boss design, but there is enemy design and lead designer, so... Michiho Hayashi, Koji Takahashi, and Hirohito Shinoda. I'm sure each of you had at least some say in how stellar these bosses turn out, so if I ever run into you on the street, let me know, because I'm buying you a pizza. Each of you your own pizza. I appreciate the work you have done, and you are truly some of the most unsung heroes in the history of Zelda, because you have designed some of the greatest bosses in the entire series in a game no one talks about. You're unsung heroes. Now... It feels kind of weird to say this, because it came so fast. 
But that is all of the single player content and associated topics that I wanted to talk about today. It's all done. I hope that even if you didn't enjoy Phantom Hourglass, I got you to give it another shot. And even if not, I hope that I gave you an appreciation for some of the better aspects of this game. I will never say, oh my gosh, this game is brilliant and why can nobody see the genius in it? No, this game's good. Has a lot of solid points to it and I find it very interesting to talk about because it just comes out of nowhere with brilliant stuff from time to time. And it's really amazing when it does. But it was more that I found it interesting and I wanted more people to talk about it and acknowledge it for its strengths. If you still don't really care for the game much, I can't say I really blame you all that much. I'm personally ready to never have to play the Temple of the Ocean King ever again after running it here for you today. You know what? No. I wouldn't say that I really got a headache from running it this last time because I know it well enough now because of all the shortcuts and how much practice I have and oh my god, I'm turning into the very thing I hate. What have I become? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess that's it. I'll see you back here next time. When Ciela got that hammer, I thought I knew where this was going, and I'm very sad that this ended without Link and Ciela playing tennis. <laughs>